After I was ordained to the priesthood, I spent a year in Rome completing my studies. During that year, about once a week, I would get up early and head across the city to St. Peter's Basilica to offer Mass at one of the many side altars in the Basilica. The doors would open shortly before 7 a.m., and it was always a wonderful experience to enter the big, empty Basilica and get ready for Mass. For about an hour after the various priests had offered their Masses, I would make a mini pilgrimage of the Basilica and pray. Then around about 8.30, 9am, the first wave of the tourists would arrive. And no matter how many times the various guards and ushers would say, Silencio! The hustle and bustle of those eager to get a snap in front of the main altar or beside the Pieta statue would continue. In amongst those groups of sightseers were ordinary faithful who had come there to spend some time in prayer, something which proved more difficult as the morning moved on and the tourists increased. Even in the Adoration Chapel inside the Basilica, the silence in there was often disturbed by the hustle and bustle going on outside in the main body of the Basilica. For some, St. Peter's Basilica is a wonderful, faith-filled experience of the house of God. For others, it's just a very elaborate religious museum and they treat it accordingly. Until its destruction in the year 70 AD, the temple in Jerusalem was the centre of all Jewish worship. The faithful would go to Jerusalem and present various offerings laid down by the Mosaic law. Among these were offerings of cattle and sheep and pigeons. Since God deserves only the best, These animals were were meant to be the best of quality, without blemish. However, transporting a sound animal many miles, or maybe even overseas, to Jerusalem might well endanger the required soundness or perfection of the animal. And so a system was in operation whereby you could buy the animal at the temple, which could then be offered in the temple. The money changers were there to ensure that no pagan coinage would be brought into the temple treasury. These coins often bore the image of a god or a ruler like the emperor who might claim to be a god. This was considered idolatry and against the law of Moses, and so the temple had its own coinage which was exchanged for the pagan coinage. When Jesus drives the sellers of these animals and the money changers out of the temple, it's not likely that he is doing it as a rejection of buying and selling of animals, or that it is an angry outburst against the sacrifices being offered in the temple. That the buying and selling of animals and the money exchanging is happening is not really the problem. Where this is happening is the problem. For the temple was meant to be a place of prayer, a place where God was to be encountered. And they had turned the house of prayer into a marketplace. They had allowed the secular realm to invade the sacred, the worldly things to take over the things of heaven. My father's house is a house of prayer. Jesus says this, and then he takes the rope whip and drives them all out. Jesus, we're told, when questioned about his actions, goes on to indicate that his body, he himself, is the true, new and great temple. But we know also from scripture that being members of his body, we, each of us, being baptised, are also temples of the Holy Spirit. St. Paul tells us in the first letter to the Corinthians, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, 
God's temple is sacred, and you are that temple. Lent provides us with the opportunity to examine what is in us, to see if there is something that is part and parcel of our daily lives that is not really compatible with who we are as sons and daughters of God, temples of the Holy Spirit. It might be good to ask ourselves a question. Imagine for a moment that Jesus were to walk into our temple. What would he find there? What would he need to drive out? What is in my life that is taking God's place? What ways of acting or thinking show that I am too focused on worldly things to the detriment of my focus on heavenly things? Remembering Jesus' words, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world but to lose his soul? In a certain sense, to do a good Lent is like handing Jesus a whip and allowing him to displace those things which have no place in our lives or which have disproportionately taken too much from us at God's expense. Lent gives us an opportunity to give back to God what belongs to God. Perhaps in the days ahead, we might find and focus on even just one area of our lives where something is off track in our way of living the Christian life, to find something that is not as God would have it. It could be an inordinate attachment to something. It could be a sinful behavior. It could be a lack of discipline or neglect of prayer. It could be so many different things. But it's always going to be something which is not compatible with being a holy temple of the Holy Spirit and something which is not leading us towards our heavenly goal. Now, maybe with a little reflection, we might find more than one thing. But pick just one thing for now. And imploring the grace of God, this Lent, let each of us allow the Lord to drive it out and to build something new and glorious and holy in its place.